Uh, so thank you so much for allowing me to give a presentation today, and I'm very excited to talk about you know, one of my favorite subjects, which is electronic structure simulations. And I understand that probably a couple years ago, this was the favorite topic for everyone in quantum computing. Um, you know, I'm a little bit sad to see that not everyone wants to talk about it anymore, but this wouldn't be a quantum computing conference without some electronic structure simulations, so uh, let's get started. Uh, but first and foremost, I should talk about, you know, what is OTI Lumionics? Because we're a bit of a different company than most of the other quantum computing companies around here. We don't necessarily make sense as one of the ideal partners for a quantum computing company, but one of the things that we have a core strength is that we actually make chemicals. So we eat our own cooking. Whatever we do in electronic structure simulation, we actually end up using those principles. So we wouldn't continue to develop electronic structure simulations on a quantum computer unless it actually benefited us, or we, at least we saw the long-term benefit in designing materials. And this is one of the, or this is one of the core materials that we have actually designed. And this is a material which is actually sold and Strangely enough, companies actually purchase this because they see value in it in their products. And some new products that are gonna come out um, either end of this year or next year um, are things such as like transparent TV. So this is actually a transparent TV that OTI fabricated ourselves um, with our material. And this, is one, this material enables transparent TVs and transparent displays to have approximately between 65 to 75% transparency, which is the highest in the industry at this current point in time. So, you know, how does OTI really do this? Is we use a combination of uh, basically this material discovery platform, which is a combination of uh, simulations, machine learning, and actually production testing. That's one of the key factors that differentiates OTI from many other startups in the OLED industry is that we actually have a miniature fabrication lab where we can actually build OLEDs at a small scale. We can actually sit down and run a very complicated machine which actually will make OLEDs continuously, which is very unique. You'll, you will rarely find another startup in the OLED space that actually has that internal capability. Uh, but this is what actually gives us our strength is that we're actually able to take information from the uh, from the production side and actually integrate that into our machine learning algorithms. Um, and currently we run all of this pretty predominantly on our CPUs and GPU clusters. We actually have a one petaflop uh, supercomputing cluster. And what we hope to do is we hope to run these things on uh, QPUs one day. And we'll tell you why. So, you know, we're particularly very, uh, we actually like doing quantum chemistry at OTI Lumionics, which I know is a bit strange. Um, but why does it benefit us in particular? Um, I think OLEDs is one of the few domains where quantum, like electronic structure theory and quantum chemistry actually has a direct impact. If you can do quantum chemistry very effectively, you can simulate UV vis spectra, you can simulate transparency, refractive index, fluorescence spectra, density of states, charge transport. These are all the properties that as an OLED chemist, we care about. And that's how we actually design our OLEDs. That's how we're enabled to make them transparent. But all of chemistry, even whether you do computational or you're in organic chemistry, it all comes down to this fundamental principle that structure results in the property of a material. Uh, to give a bit of background, which uh, I can see is a bit redundant here, is we're gonna talk a little bit about variational quantum eigensolver. Uh, so variational quantum eigensolver is one of the key uh, NISC era algorithms. And effectively what you're able to do is you're able to do this hybrid interaction between a quantum processor and a classical processor in order to basically calculate the expectation value of a molecular Hamiltonian. I'm sure most of you know what that is, um, but we need, to get, uh, we need to talk about some of the dark sides of doing quantum chemistry on a quantum computer. So one of the big things is that the two cubic uh, gate count scales very poorly. So in order to simulate something like you know, a water molecule, you may need over a thousand C naught gates. Can quantum computers in this era or even the next era, are they gonna be able to necessarily do that? That's an important question. Or are there things on the theoretical side that we could do to alleviate this? Um, most algorithms require full qubit to qubit connectivity and that's a very important uh, distinction. Is that, you know, most architectures, they're not, all the qubits are not fully interconnected. So you're gonna to have to do all these additional swap gates on top of all your C naught gates. And the VQE measurement 
actually scales fairly poorly with problem size. As the problem gets bigger, you need to sample more and more Hamiltonians in your VQE problem. Um, so in order to remedy kind of the first issue with uh, C not gate scaling poorly is we invented something called the qubit couple cluster method, which is a new theory to generate these circuits. It's like the unitary couple cluster, except in this case, we're not doing a trotterization step. We're just directly generating our entanglement, what we would call tanglements, entanglement states. So this is just one of the first simulations that we actually did uh, fairly early on. You can see that qubit couple cluster actually is considered what is considered to be, it will generate a full CI solution if done to completion. You can see it's quite nice. Um, this is actually the circuit diagram that it produces. So I understand that on Rigetti's uh, tutorial website, they even have three qubit gate, uh, three C naught gates in order to actually simulate H2. You actually only require two. Um, and one of the main benefits is that compared to unitary couple cluster, this, uh, the number of C naught gates scales a lot better. So from a purely theoretical standpoint, without having even touched the hardware, we're already enable, we already enable alleviation of certain hardware demands. Now, of course, you know, we're still looking to uh, improve the compilation, but this simulation was actually done on Rigetti. This one right here, and this was one of the earlier ones. This was actually done on the 19, um, the 19Q Acorn. So, but this doesn't necessarily resolve the full, the interconnectivity uh, thing, uh, the lack of full connectivity. So what we decided to do is we decided to generate what is called an iterative qubit couple cluster. So what we're gonna do, and I'll show you, demonstrate this problem, is we're gonna have this, basically we're gonna take water molecule, we're gonna generate some entanglement gates. We use poly operators in a theoretical language, because that's how we just calculate them in order to determine what the generators are. Um, and what this means is that this means if we want to look at how we entangle the first, how we generate the line for the first entanglement, like which qubits we need to entangle for the first entangler, uh, we notice that we can get a linear entanglement. But if we also want to be running that on the exact same circuit, now we'll have to actually add some swap gates. And so this increases the load and the demand on the actual quantum computer. So what are we gonna do? Well, first of all, we're actually going to run on the quantum computer each entangler set independently. And after we optimize the first entanglement set, we're actually gonna integrate it back into the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian will eventually expand. And it is true that in the worst case scenario, especially with systems that are very diffuse, it, the Hamiltonian actually will scale almost exponentially unless you start to kind of prune it back a bit. Um, but what this enables you to do is, here's a simulation that was also done on Rigetti for water and it allows you to have very nice crisp values. And you can see that with this one, we're actually able to, even on Rigetti system, actually approach chemical accuracy, so long as we simulate in small chunks, right? We're kind of bypassing this issue of having to dump all these circuit, all the circuit depth on a quantum computer at the expense of loading more onto a classical computer. But this is the flexibility. You don't have to say that I have to simulate each entangler independently. You can actually group them, simulate them as a group, then load them back onto the Hamiltonian. Um, and exactly how the math works behind this is that with all qubit couple cluster on sauces is that they are arbitrarily generated. But what this enables you to do is that if we take our first generator from before, we once again get a linear connectivity, but when we go and optimize our second uh, entangler, we're able to swap the indices of the qubit when we actually go in to optimize those parameters. And this allows us to create, in a, if the connectivity of the circuit, of the quantum computer is an issue, this allows us to generate a purely linear connection. So one of the other things that uh, we did uh, and I did in collaboration with uh, Andrew Jenna and Michaela Mosca, both from the University of Waterloo, is we uh, figured out a, what is called a Clifford gate set to actually measure all commuting sets of these poly operators within the Hamiltonian. And uh, I don't have enough time to exactly get into the mathematics. We can describe it in much more depth. But basically one of the issues with VQE is that you have to sample each term in the Hamiltonian unless they commute. And a lot of these sets do commute but some of the issues is that if you're using just individual qubit measurement protocols, you will miss a lot of commuting sets. So what we can do is we can actually develop a Clifford gate that will measure commuting sets 
that would not be measurable only if you were to measure the qubits individually. And so this is actually one of the simulations we did, and we include the error bars on this because this one has no error correction or kind of data cleaning in it, which is something that we're kind of, uh, that we like to do a lot in these cases. Um, and you can see though that when we measure them uh, individually or uh, each term individually or whether we me measure them as a commuting set, it doesn't make a difference on the outcome. But when you actually look at the number of measurements you have to do in the, for the Hamiltonian, you'll notice that we can get incredibly good scaling results. You can see for something like ALQ3, you can get almost a factor of, I believe that's about 10, even 10 to 100 almost, 10 to 20. So we're having outstanding time scaling reductions by using these protocols. So where do we, you know, but I'm still an applicationist, so I wanna know where are we gonna go with this because you know, why do quantum chemistry on a quantum computer anyways? Like what benefit does doing quantum chemistry on a quantum computer have over on a classical computer? Well, one area where, quant where we've noticed some great results from qu doing quantum chemistry specifically on a quantum computer, or at least in the language of quantum computing, is particularly for uh, these things where we, you know, where we talk about like charged atom or charged molecules. And this is an issue where standard methods such as Hartree-Fock or even CISD sometimes have issues converging. And these are because they're these states are frustrated or they are being elongated and the electron, the exact electron location or even where it should be in the orbitals, the orbitals start to come even closer in energy. A quantum computer doesn't seem to have these issues. So it's able to converge actually quite rapidly. And one of the key, you know, where we expect the first dominant application to be for quantum chemistry on quantum computers to be, is in reaction chemistry. And this continues, you know, as a quantum chemist and someone who actually designs materials, you know, this is one of my biggest personal pain points is that, you know, we want to do a reaction. One reaction will work with one set of reagents and the other one will not work with another set of reagents. And, you know, maybe we only changed one atom in one of the reagents. One will work, the other one will not. You know, why? And we ask the, we try to simulate this using computational chemistry on a classical computer and we can barely get a result out. But this is one of the areas where we've seen, you know, from a theoretical basis by simulating this SN2 reaction here, actually in a, in a theoretical, uh, more as on a simulator, we've actually seen very good results, like very good agreement with what it should be. And this is where we expect, you know, some of the first applications with quantum chemistry on a quantum computer to really be, is in these really difficult transition states. Uh, so thank you so much for your time, and uh, I guess we'll carry on with the next presentation. <laughs>